Welcome to Slime House, a podcast defining a genre of outrageous hijinks, crude humor, and mild language. This week, we have a very special episode, an interview with actor Christopher McDonald. Perhaps best known for his role as Shooter McGavin in Happy Gilmore, McDonald is a prolific actor of the silver screen with over 200 IMDb credits to his name since his debut in Grease 2 and he's appeared in a slew of Slimehouse movies, often in sleazy or sneezy roles. We'll dive into each of his Slimehouse movies over the course of this episode. Enjoy! All right, well, yeah, first off, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's, been, it's been fun for the last couple of days. We've been trying to catch up on as many movies as we can, and there are a lot that you are in. Um, IMDb has you at over 200 credits as the time of writing. And I guess that just starting broadly, I mean, you're a very prolific actor and, and you've had so many different types of roles and, you know, TV, movies, independent, big budget, Oscar winner, small scale, you name it. And my question for you is just when you, thinking back to when you first started as an actor, did you ever imagine what this was going to be like and how does it compare to how you first set out to be as an actor? I must say that I have uh, far exceeded my expectations. I had no idea uh, when I getting it. I thought I was going to be a stage actor for the rest of my life. Uh, when I started out, I did about 35 plays. And then, uh, you know, when you're in Hollywood, you kind of have to bloom where you're planted. And so I discovered commercials and discovered, you know, television and discovered movies and like, wow. So I just been riding the wave. It's like this as all actors lives are. Uh, sometimes you're always in demand. I mean, it, it and sometimes um, you're staring at your phone, going, "What is it me?" <laughs> so <laughs> it's the kind of thing is is uh, uh, you know during this crazy time right now we're in. I, I've got two jobs lined up, but I don't know when I'm going to be able to shoot them mm -hmm. because of the you know the the crazy virus we're living through. So um, it's just a roller coaster. It's always a guessing game. It's uh, it's been some of the best of times and it's been some of the worst of times because when you are on, uh, you got a hit behind you, like say, a, you know, Thelma Louise or a, a quiz show, something like that, something that, you know, gets Oscar, uh, you know, love. It's a great, uh, a great little like a uh, launching pad. Oh, get that guy, get the guy. But the only problem is they want you to do the same damn thing over and over again. That's why I do independent film because I'm allowed to choose yay or nay, yay or nay where I want to do it. But I, I like this recent one I just did. I said, I played that part many times. I can do it in my sleep. I like the other guy. And they mm -hmm. went, dude, that'd be awesome to do the other guy. So now I'm playing things that are against type and it's, it's working out pretty well. Very cool. Um, a lot of kind of your more kind of beloved roles or kind of in like a comedic vein is is comedy something you were primarily drawn into or something that you kind of fell into um that's a good question i didn't think i started out as a bad guy because you know i'm six three and you know and most guys are you know you're not gonna work with tom cruise because he's you know five eight so uh, <laughs> uh so if you're if you're a big irish mug like me uh you're gonna play the bad guy and i've done that did that plenty of times um and then i found that I could be funny if they if the material was there and I could add lib stuff I tell you I don't know it's just um, I, I never thought I was going to be this you know known as a comedic type because um, I've done a lot of great dramas too but um, people love to hate me <laughs> they love to like oh that guy he just drove me nuts I mean I don't know how many people on the street would, would say why were you so mean to Thelma I said yes but it was funny wasn't it you know people <laughs> <laughs> so you know you, you you take it from life. I took a lot of that stuff from watching um, watching those harried uh, the, you know the, the salesman guys, and they're in the airports and they're like, "How are you doing at the bar talking to these shit?" <laughs> Dude, that is the sickest. But I'm stealing it and I'm putting it up on film. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love that. Um, do you want to jump into the the quick rundown? Yeah, go for it, Jasper. Yeah, we can do that. So kind of this, this podcast is kind of centered around a very specific era. I think Nelson kind of gave you the lowdown of this kind of kind of 80s to early thousands kind of family film that we lovingly call Slime House. 
um, which a lot of which you have kind of started in. Um, so really quick, we just kind of want to go one by one and kind of name a film. And then you can give a one to two sentence summary of kind of what comes to mind uh, when you hear that movie. Okay. Um, so Jared, do you want to kick it off? Yes. Hi, Christopher. Um, Hi, Jared. So my movie is Wondering Near and Dear to My Heart. And it's, uh, I think, uh, um, I thought about it a lot this week because uh, they announced this documentary on HBO about Robin Williams and his last um, few days, but uh, Flubber. Yeah. Flubber was an extraordinary experience. The, the director, Les Mayfield, uh, put up with me bringing my, I guess, seven-year-old son into the audition room because I was, I was stuck with him that day. But it didn't hurt. I think it kind of helped. I got into this. I got the part knowing, knowing Robin Williams was attached already. The greatest thing about that was Robin Williams is a literal genius. He would, between setups, make a rap song up about all of the people in the movie, all the people that are working <laughs> in the movie, knowing their names, rhyming. It's kind of like that freestyle rap they're doing now on Broadway. Extraordinary, extraordinary experience. Um, I had more fun than ever with him. Uh, my biggest fear was that he was going to be on all the time, but he wasn't. He was a really down to earth, really fun guy. I'd met him years ago, but he didn't remember. But anyway, that's more than two <laughs> seconds. It was a great experience. I'll tell you what. And, and funny, there's nobody funnier or was nobody funnier than him. So. Wow. Max, want to go? Oh, uh, yeah. The movie I'm asking about is uh, 1994's Monkey Trouble. A classic. <laughs> uh, that was a fun movie to make and, and for two reasons uh, first of all um, Franco Amori directed it and it was um, a chance to work with Harvey Keitel again who's one of my favorites we had already done uh, Thelma and Louise together and um, we had a lot of fun he couldn't keep a straight face so uh, that was that was very fun and this time that I was the cop and he was the bad guy so uh, it was a nice little spin on that it's a good little movie. Um, Thora Birch was terrific in it for, for the start of her career. And um, what can I say other than the fact that it was a lot of fun to do? Awesome. Uh, yeah. Next up, Leave It to Beaver. All right. Leave It to Beaver was an interesting thing. I had worked with the producer before, Robert Simons, who still works to this day. He's a very, very prolific producer. Um, I'd done Happy Gilmore with him, and he said, he called me up and I'm on vacation in Italy, literally get this call. I'm like, who is calling for the United States? That's going to be, you know, eight bucks a minute. So I went, all right. Oh, it's Robert Simons. Right. All right. And I'm walking around this Plaza Navona and he says, do you want to play Ward Cleaver in the new movie, Leave it to Beaver? Yep. That'd be the, the new edition. I went, well, hell yeah, I do. Why not? Ward Cleaver, one of the great, I mean, th that series I grew up on. So it was an honor to be asked to do it. Uh, the people were great. They looked for this kid. They found this great kid, Cameron. They found this kid after looking for like maybe 3,000 kids. He's very funny. Um, he's very heartwarming little, little stinker that he was. And, uh, you know, it was just a, it was a chance to work on a back lot that you don't usually get to do very often, um, you know, if you're, you're a vagabond actor. Um, which I, I, would, I would go, you know, where the wind blew me. If there was an interesting role, I would do it. And that was a great experience because, uh, you know, the expectations were quite high. I think the movie still holds up quite well. It's just that, you know, especially you, your age, your guys, when it came out. And it was, it was something I had to do for my kids because, you know, I do a lot of these little darker things like, you know, Requiem for a Dream or something. You're not going to see that. So... Uh, what does daddy do when he's gone all the time? So uh, I was glad I did it. It was, it was a really fun make, movie to make. And, um, and uh, again, just a, just a, a great experience. And, and working on the back lot and having my parents come and then, you know, be on the back lot of, of Universal was, was a real thrill. And the only time I did that uh, to, to great effect was uh, a movie called uh, The Perfect Storm where I walked in to meet the director, Wolfgang Peterson, and they were doing the interior. You guys remember that movie, right? The interior yeah. <laughs> of, of the storm where they had a, had a big soundstage and they filled it halfway full of water, had Ritter fans going like crazy. And this, this boat was being pulled up and down. George Clooney's up there and, you know, it's just, 
it was nuts to watch the spectacle of it. So working on those those uh, those classic Hollywood, all you know, there's only about five of them on those uh, big back lots is just one of the biggest thrills ever. Totally. Um, all right, my movie uh, is Dutch. That's 1991. 1991. Wow. Dutch. Uh, Ed O'Neill, classic. Um, there's a scene where, you know, so it's, it's a great movie. It's, it's the great uh, Chicago writer, uh, remind me really, uh, John, John, um, John Hughes. John Hughes. John Hughes, the great John Hughes. He wasn't on set, but one day he came in, he went with this movie came out, which is called Home Alone, Slapstick is in. So he said, you know, go crazy. So we were doing this scene, it was freezing cold in Chicago at the time. And uh, I had to go up and, you know, be getting Ed O'Neill's face as, as the, you know, the father of the son there. And he, uh, he comes out and says, yeah, you treat this kid right or, I'll, you know, and he knocks me right in the face. And I did a thing where I, there was, thank God, snow below me. I threw my feet up over my head and I went down like I was like, wow, and stood up and went, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> but that was the kind of slapstick they were looking for. And John Hughes couldn't have been happier. He was like, get over here and give me a big hug. It was very sweet. <laughs> but that was a great movie. Uh, Joe, Joe Beth Williams, fantastic to work with. And uh, just another great experience. Awesome. And certainly last, but not, certainly not least, House Arrest. House Arrest. Put a bunch of crazy actors whose kids are sticking them into the basement because they want to get their rights all set out. Oh, oh my God, what a fun movie to make. Um, that was crazy. And the funny thing about that, I never said this, I don't think any, in any kind of interview was I had to be, I had to have an allergic thing. You have to be able to sneeze all the time. Right. And <laughs> so I would sneeze because it's a dusty basement. So I just, <laughs> that kind of stuff like that, where you, you know, you affect it. Not one person in the whole cast said, God bless you. <laughs> oh, not one. I'm thinking, no, people are ad-libbing right and left. No one would say, you know, God bless you or Kazuntide or something. Nothing. I felt, uh, wow, okay. So I found this. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need sleeping bags, honey, oh. because we're not staying another night in this godforsaken. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ah! Oh my God, look, give me the roll. That was a fun movie, a great bunch of kids too. Amazing. Yeah, so one question we had is that like, in that movie you're allergic to mold and then in Monkey Trouble you're allergic to like, to pets. Yes. So we were wondering like, are your allergies in real life like that? Or like, like uh, I only have one allergy, it's to cottonwood trees. And that's where I grew up in upstate New York. I left, came to California, mm -hmm. came back home and now I could not even like, I, I would go in June and these, these little fuzz balls that go through the air from these cottonwood trees. And I would just be a wreck. And if I, you know, I'd pop every, you know, antihistamine you could get, but I still kind of mastered it because the drugs are good. But uh, <laughs> wow, it, it's, it's, it was pretty funny how, I guess I could, uh, if I'm challenged to do something, it's hard to sneeze on cue or to, you know, um, cry on cue or whatever like that. But you have to, as an actor, you have to have these, these things be able to pull out of the air and like that. So you just, you know, just take it from life and, uh, and bring it on. And I was kind of fearless. That's the kind of thing that's about my career. I've been kind of fearless in doing different things. I've been asked to do some crazy stuff in my business. And uh, the, it's one of the fun lines. Somebody else said it, but the crazy stuff I've done for the dollar. It's amazing. So uh, um, I, I did a lot of fun doing that movie, uh, Monkey Trouble. It was, um, uh, you know, yeah, Monkey Trouble and 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 the other and uh, the, the the kids locking us in the basement. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was a a sneeze actor. Get that guy who sneezes really well. <laughs> I don't know. Um, as obviously, a lot of these movies we're talking about are like family films. So um, as a father. Is there a special attraction to kind of making family films? You already kind of touched on it, so it's something your kids could see. But um, is is there? Do you see them kind of as a way to teach children about coming of age or understanding their parents? And in a weird way, kind of you know. Speak That's to a your very own good children. question, and I'll tell you uh, in, in in like three words: um, the Iron Giant. I did that movie. It's animated. 
with a great cast, but that story was so affecting and still is, holds up. It's one of the, you know, one of those Rotten Tomato things. It's like 99%. It's uh, one of those great movies. And um, a lot of people don't know I did it, but, and I, I, I thank to this day, Brad Bird, who, you know, Oscar winning Brad Bird, the Incredibles, things like that. He is a, a, a brilliant kid and this was his first big shot. And he chose me over a lot of sexier choices for the actor to play this, this you know, Kent Mansley, I work for the government, and all that implies. And it was, uh, <laughs> he just really wanted my kind of like snarky little, you know, self-important take on it. So um, thanks to him. Hey there, Scout. Kent Mansley, I work for the government. I took my kids to the premiere of it. I'm sitting right behind Pete Townsend. Yes, that oh, Pete wow. Townsend, who owned the rights to the movie. And he was there to see this big premiere where Man's Chinese in Hollywood, the biggest, you know, hoopla opening you can imagine. And um, they laughed. They looked over me, that over at me, and they went, Dad, it's great. And then not, you know, 10 minutes later, the tears were dollops down their face. I said, this is an instant classic, an instant classic. So that message was terrific. Um, I wish more of my movies had messages, but uh, but for that, you know, for that one, that was something to to share that with my children. I was so glad I was in it. Love that. And there's definitely some touching moments too in, you know, both Monkey Trouble and Leave it to Beaver, um, kind of, you know, parents understanding children and vice versa. Um, yeah, my favorite scene in that movie, just, just a quick uh, thing was, um, I was, I was home for all of my children's birth, except for my daughter, Rosie. And I was doing the teacup scene where, mm. and also having this big interview that I had three people like, I want to ask one of these questions. And here I was thinking, I'm missing the birth of my daughter and I'm talking to my son on film. And it's the best scene I think in the movie, um, for me anyway. Um, it was really trying to understand like almost man to man or you know, it's father to son, the important things in life and how he was scared to tell me the truth because he thought I might think this about him. And, it always it was it was based in love and it turned out really well and that kind of stuff just having other things happening in my life wishing i was someplace else perhaps but just being in focused and being in that moment it's a great little scene love that are there any um are there any of your movies that your kids have uh not liked and have expressed to you i don't really like that movie <laughs> um they don't watch a lot of my movies these days. They're like too busy. So uh, <laughs> I do a lot of like, like I say, like 200 something you know, credits. Um, literally I had to take, it was like, kids, you've never seen Grease 2? Come on, man. <laughs> during, during this thing, like, you're watching it right now. We're putting it on. And they loved it because it was a really good story because I have three girls and a boy. The girls were really empowered. Michelle Pfeiffer played a character that, head of the tea, you know, little pink ladies, and I was a, one of the tea birds. And uh, she said, I don't want this you know, football guy, the jock like everybody else wants. I want a cool rider. I want someone to just kind of sweep me off my feet and you know, keep me guessing all the time. And it was a great message. So she would like turn all these other, you know, because she's beautiful, she's not Michelle Fiber. And uh, I want to tell you, it was, it was a great message. And when they finally saw it, they were like, dad, why didn't we watch that earlier? I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. And then, and then I started making them watch a few other things. So I think we, we actually finally sat down and watched, with the family, watched Happy Gilmore. And it's been 20 something years. Okay, 25 years. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's amazing that, um, you know, we have, they have appreciation for what I do. That's why I like to do some of those films for them. But mostly it's, it's, you know, it's my journey. My wife like, loves what I do and everything, loves all the perks that come with it. But ultimately it's, it's, it's the actor doing his thing. And if, and if people respond to it, great. Um, because once you get a hit or two, it's a nice little ride for three to four to five years. Um, and then ultimately, you know, and they do that retrospective when you get to be my age and they go, oh yeah, that was a great one. And that was under love. Nobody saw them. I was listening to um, the great, um, movie oh my god it's such a good movie it came out the year that we, we did quiz show the robert redford film about the end of innocence in america with the the cheating on the on the, uh, the the show 21 the shawshank redemption that year i believe it was that year it wasn't gump we got gumped one year too anyway uh, <laughs> but but that, that 
that particular movie was great. And I was listening to Morgan Freeman talking about how it didn't make any, any, any business at the, at the box office. And he explained that, I just saw this great movie. Oh my God, guys, you're gonna love it. What's it called? Shank, 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 Shaw, Shik, Shang. They couldn't say Shawshank Redemption. No one can remember the name of the damn thing. <laughs> really funny. He did that thing on he was a comedian. It was very, very funny. Um, but uh, you know, you, you do things like that, and, and and man, you have a you have a nice little ride for a few years. So it's kind of great. That makes me want to ask the question of what are some of movies in your filmography that you feel like have been overlooked or not given their due in that same way that you worked on that you appreciate? Um, well, I, one just came out. Um, it was a it was a pretty big hit, I guess. Like, so I'm not answering your question right, but it was a big hit on the, on Netflix called The Stand at Paxton County. True story about the horse thievery by the police bad guy. Um, uh, but it happens all the time, and, and people really respect that kind of stuff when they tell you know, a story that's really prevalent, really going on in, the, in Dakotas right now, and all, and all the northern uh, states where all these people are losing their their livestock for you know health reasons. So that kind of stuff. But that that was a message. That was a good thing. But you know, it was it was tough. I would love for it to have a a, a uh, premiere out in the world so people could actually see it. But then COVID came along and they put it on um, and really really promoted it well on uh, Netflix. So. But uh, I've had many that have not uh, gotten a lot of the, the love they should have. Um, well, Requiem for a Dream was, was a perfect example. I mean, yes, they, I was watching it. It's the first time I went to Cannes. And I'm in, in, in Cannes, and I'm sitting at the premiere of this thing. It's at, at the prestigious you know, midnight screening of it. And it's packed. And this movie, and I'm looking, and I'm like, oh, my God. And I worked like you know eight days on this thing, but you know they piece me out throughout and I'm looking over the director Darren Aronofsky who's a genius by the way and he goes yeah I'm like, oh my God. he goes no make it even better so it was like what and I'm watching this thing and and, and and at the end everybody's floored and it was complete silence for about what seems like eight minutes but it was probably a minute and a half because people just couldn't do it and then to a roaring standing ovation and it was just one of those crazy moments that is seared into my brain as uh, what the power of film can do. Did it do great in the real world? Not so much, but uh, you know, Ellen Bernstein, who I was lucky enough to, to work opposite, a brilliant actress. She was, that was her fifth Oscar nomination for that. And uh, I mean, just terrific actors in it. And, um, but there, there are a lot of independent films that never see the light of day because they don't have the money behind them to get people out there to see them. So you do a movie for, you know, $3 million, you're going to need another $3 million to sell it. And a lot of times that doesn't happen. It makes it a lot easier for somebody like Netflix or Amazon Prime or something like that to pick them up now and you, you'll make your money back and not as much as, but still your product will be seen. So it's nice um, that that's working out, but. There's too many to talk about yeah. that, that, yeah. that, that get the right, didn't get their due. Um, anyway, I, a lot, a lot of ones in TV too that just come and go, and you think, God, that was really good. I wish, like, I wish that people could see that right now. Everyone's just sitting home, like, what can we watch? What can we watch? Because I didn't I had the blessings of working with some great people. Um, Kathy Bates, for example, in a series that David E. Kelly wrote called Harry's Law. And I come in as a guest star and we had this connection and David E. Kelly wrote this beautiful, beautiful part for me and then made me a series regular. And it was a complete blast to work with the, the likes of Kathy Bates and one of the most authentically fantastic people, no bullshit actor, just a, you know, right there, what you see is what you get. And it's, it's rare air to be in around that because it's, they're, they're, she's, a, she's one of those unique talents. And I love that part, but you can't even like, I don't know where to find it these days. So that kind of stuff mm -hmm. frustrates you because there's, there's a plethora of, you know, Marvel shows and all that kind of stuff. And like, you know, you know, kill the girl and the cartoons and stuff. But yeah. that's what people like to watch, apparently. Especially your age, your guys, you like to watch that stuff. Um, I get it. I think they're fantastic. I, sure, I've, I've done it, but I did the spoof of it. That was a funny movie, superhero movie. In a lot of ways, ahead of its time, honestly. Ahead of time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but it, it didn't do well. Miramax production, and uh, they 
know, they brought in all these crazy just to, to beef it up. Uh, they bring in, you know, anyway, it was, it was refreshing that it didn't get enough love, but I had a, had a great part in that too. Sure. I played the hourglass. It was right at the time Iron Man was coming out and I made this bold statement because I've worked with Robert before, Robert Downey. We, we played the same soul in Chances Are years ago. So uh, uh, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take on that Iron Man. You can see what happened there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very funny. Oh, that's awesome. I am the hourglass, and your time is up. One thing I noticed is sort of, you mentioned that you often found yourself playing the same type of roles or whatever, but I noticed that time and time again, I would see you in love triangles or be two guys jockeying for one woman. We saw that in Monkey Trouble, we saw that in Dutch, saw that in Flubber, Delma and Louise. And so tell me, what do you, I mean, what do you make of that when you have these kind of recurring tropes that keep coming back? Yeah, yeah, I never get the girl. <laughs> good. <laughs> That's never good. Uh, I I used to get the girl, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I just think it, it just happens. The funniest version of that was a thing. I rest in, rest his soul. What? But the great Carl Reiner did did a movie um, that I was you know, he he chose me to be in, and it was such a joy to do. Um, and I'm in bed with uh, Kate Nelligan and Armand Asante. And so I'm reaching over, if you can imagine, oh my God, uh, reaching over thinking it's her and it's not and it's him, but his arms are hairy or her arms are hairy. It was like really funny. It's a funny little uh, thing. And it's, um, I'm thinking of the name of the movie now. Um, it was really originally called Triple Indemnity, which is a really funny title because of double indemnity there will be. Yeah. But this, that was called Fatal, Fatal, um, Fatal instinct, fatal instinct, because it wasn't fatal attraction, but it was fatal instinct. So, it uh, it didn't make the noise I would love it to make. It's a very funny, very funny movie. Sean Young's in it, and and like I said, Kate Nelligan, Armand, and um, a bunch of other people. And uh, and working with the great Carl Reiner was a joy. Uh, just one of the greatest, one of the nicest men in the show business. So it was uh, the whole thing was a great experience. But yeah, I don't know why that happens. I just, they, they think, oh yeah, get that guy. He'll do it. He's great. <laughs> so they like the typecast. Hey, hey, look, at the point in the beginning when they were typecasting me as, as the bad guy, the fall guy, whatever, I get, I've been killed like 55 times in, in movies and television. It's like, I should have a reel made of all the times I've been shot. And we'll get to work on that. Because <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny right there. I have a lot like of Sean Bean. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of actor friends that that, that, uh, that bemoan the same thing. I've died more than you. No way, really? But, uh, <laughs> so we laugh about it anyway. But uh, I don't know why that is. But um, I love to work, and I say yes. And I just uh, if it's a similar part I've done before, I want to take a new spin at it and uh, take it from a different angle. And uh, I'm usually embraced by by those choices, and they they go with it. So, but I usually give them you know, three or four different choices too, so they can make it make it up their minds. So. But that's, that's the joy of doing doing several takes too. You can just keep your other, your partner. It's like a tennis game. You keep them like, whoa, nice slice. Where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. You just kind of come, come with a different uh, attack on things and it's, it's kind of fun. So, um, so when uh, we're talking about how uh, Flubber is a remake of Absent Minded Professor, which um, it, that movie came out when, um, when you were on the same age that we were when Flubber came out. So like we were kind of, and there's like a character in Absent Minor Professor that's kind of like your character in Flubber. So we were wondering if like, um, do the roles that you play in some of these movies remind you of like the actors and movies that you grew up with and what your formative experiences with family movies were? It's a good question. I find that um, I didn't watch that movie. Uh, I'd seen it before with Fred McMurray, it was, it was terrific, but I was a kid. Yeah. And I knew we were doing a different spin on it. And then you, you know, cause Fred McMurray and, and, and Robin Williams, I mean, as far as comedic level, Robin's way up. Fred was just kind of that befuddled kind of guy, as I remembered. And I didn't want to see it because of the other guy. And I knew that the story was going to be similar, of course, but it's an up updated version of it. So I think many actors do that too. They don't want to be, um, they, don't, they don't want to be um, having that in the back of their mind when they're 
doing, you know, say Batman. They're not going to watch George Clooney do it again or, or watch, uh, you know, uh, a bell camera. They want to do their own Batman. So, uh, you know, so sure. Ben just says, oh, I'm going to watch, I'm going to do my own Batman. So I don't want to watch that other stuff. I don't want that in my head. At the same time, um, you know, they're, they're, if the story is the same, you, you know that there's the same way to look at it. But at the same time, this is my take. Like, even I thought that, uh, what's his name? Um, he's Batman, don't like this. He's a wonderful actor. He's from my. Uh, oh, Christian Bale or? Bale, yes, you don't like that. I thought that was a really, really cool thing to do. I mean, his, his, uh, his whole Bruce Wayne thing was different too. It, it was just, you know, wonderful actors can take different takes on things. That's why I think maybe awards should be about, let's get five actors to play the same part. See who's more interesting. Because it's the role that gets you the attention. I mean, if the movie's a big mm -hmm. hit, I mean, who's going to say who's better when it gets right down to it, unless they're paying the same part? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, on the note of on the note of Flubber, you have a very iconic moment I have to ask you about, and that is where the Flubber enters your body and you know goes through the digestive system, and and that's it's a very special low on the special effects compared to what's there. The special effect is really is you essentially, and so just. Tell me everything about that. Like, what kind of direction were you given? What was filming that like? Give me the skinny on that. I didn't want to do that when I said that to the to <laughs> John Hughes. As a matter of fact, it's it's, it's great. Um, can we not do that? Where I have to blow the flubber out of my derriere? Could we not do that? You don't you understand that is going to be one of the greatest moments of this of this movie. I went. Yeah, but I gotta do it, and it's gonna eat, and I gotta just, and it's, you know, it's kind of, it's gonna haunt me in later years, I said, or something. Like that. There's no Chris, no, no. You just go for it, and, and, and we'll just see what happens. So it was the first take. Les Mayfield is directing, he's there, everything's lit. This is the same set that Robin was like making all this stuff up about the, you know, all these big people. He was just a genius, my God. Anyway, <laughs> we start the scene and I said to myself that little guy on my shoulder said go for it just freaking go for it because you don't want to do this too many times <laughs> <laughs> so I went for it and, and that take that's in the movie is the first take I did the funniest thing about that is Robin Williams afterwards broke out laughing so hard he fell on the ground and up <laughs> like a like a dead cockroach going your career is over your career is over that funny <laughs> That's a true story, and I never actually told that before. So, wow. I mean, well, yeah, as a kid, that was always the funniest part of the movie to me. So, is that right? Where you blew yeah. it up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that it turned out, and we really only did it like once. Once after that, just for you know technical pur purposes, but it was, mm -hmm. it, it was really funny. And then I ad libbed that. Oh, mommy! <laughs> 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 you know it's gotta hurt. So yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Speaking to that improv and ad libbing, um, kind of in Monkey Trouble specifically, there's this kind of there's an animal trainer, obviously for this monkey. So in some of these, what was the element of improv there for that movie? Was it did it have to be quite controlled because of the animal on set all the time? Another good question. They had two uh, two monkeys and and like four uh, you know handlers. But the guy who had to deal with it most of the time was Harvey. So Harvey had that monkey on him at all times, Harvey Keitel. He had, you know, uh, wrap, wrapped around his neck. Um, I was literally uh, a little bit put off. My character was put off by this monkey. So I just kind of went with that too. He's probably a wonderful little animal, but uh, I was like, <laughs> being with it. So uh, the fact that there was hiding in the house and things like that was, you know, was, you know, you have to kind of look the other way. You don't want to make it. it it's a tricky thing that you have to do. Like the monkey scatters across the hallway or something. And, and, and you have to like act surprised that it's, that it's there. Like, did I, 
did I just see that? No, <laughs> no, I couldn't have been. That kind of thing. So it's that, that kind of um, denial, if you will. Um, but, you know, for the most part, these people are tremendously well-trained. Uh, they train their animals, I should say, uh, so well. There was none of that stuff. Sometimes you see it where they're like beating the, the horse or the pig, whatever it is, with the goat saying, you do it right or I'll beat you. And, and you know, when they take them home, they're like, you know, reprimanding them or something. But this was a very, very smart animal. And uh, we used paper, mostly one the entire time. And, uh, but for the most part, I mean, like I said, I didn't have that much to do with it. So it was basically just acting. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. All right. So actually the topic of our podcast is we have a genre we kind of came up with called slime house. That's kind of a name for like these kinds of kids movies that you were in a lot of like with this sort of humor, this sort of tones, for example, a uh, flubber, a uh, house arrest, leave it to beaver monkey trouble. Uh, and I was just kind of wondering if when you were working on these movies, there was like a sense at all on set of like sort of this new type of family comedy that well, was maybe a little bit distinctive from the ones in, of the past. Well, when you think about big family comedies too, uh, during that time was probably Chevy Chase doing those, you know, vacation movies or stuff, something like that. So mm -hmm. this was a big departure from that. I don't think it really uh, entered my mind that it was like we were going to do is kind of a genre thing, but I, I like what you guys are doing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you, you know, you just, each actor, uh, I mean, an actors just, you know, get the material. They, they know if it's based on something like Flubber, you can either address it and look at it and try to, you know, uh, incorporate some stuff, or you can just take your own new fresh take on it, which is the way I did it. And, um, and it was just, uh, it was just a, a just a movie. I, we didn't. I didn't think of those bigger things that it turned into that. That I did a lot of those. It's just w what was happening at the time. I don't think they make them anymore, do they? No, so, they don't. Very you know, few. Far it was just that window, right? It was that window they did it for you know ten, eight, ten years? So, right in your guys' wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. And kind of you have. Uh, one more kind of slime house movie that I think you're working on according to the internet, uh, and that's Space Jam 2. Um, the internet lies, <laughs> it does. Nah, you, I don't believe it. Space Jam 2, they shot Space Jam where I am. I, I live in the, the mountains of Lake Arrowhead, and uh, they shot that on the golf course where I play golf. So, oh, wow. yeah, I was just in Lake Arrowhead last week, it actually, yeah, it's kind of heaven, isn't it? I love it. Oh, yeah, it's very nice. Um, but yeah, they, they shot uh, Space Jam there, and that's when uh, Michael Jordan and uh, Bill Murray were playing our toughest hole, which is a dog leg left, and it's called the monster. But that's the hole they had. <laughs> uh, I'm not doing Space Jam. I have uh, two independent films lined up. I wouldn't mind doing Space Jam. I think it's kind of bad ass. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'm in the internet. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> I can't even watch things right now. I mean, yeah. with, with all the politics and the, the oh yeah, coronavirus and the, you know and the Me Too and the then the the Black Lives Matter and then the, it's like it's a whoa, it's crazy. But you know they are affecting change, which is good. And we'll see what happens in the election and all that stuff. So it's nuts. Fing fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can only hold. We can only vote, people. Vote. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Love that. I realize there's one other movie that we haven't addressed that's worth asking about, and that's uh, Spy Kids 2, Island of Lost Dreams. Thoughts on that one? First of all, one of the great directors working today is Robert Rodriguez, writer-directors. He um, wrote a little book about his early days in the business. It's a short little story, but it, uh, you guys are probably familiar with it. Yes, amazing. Uh, of course. So he just goes and does that thing. What are you going to do with your money from this experiment we're giving our blood to? Well, I'm going to buy a Trans Am, dude. What? He said, what are you going to do? I'm going to make uh, movies. <laughs> yeah, bullshit, come out of here. And that's the kind of thing. And then he turns into this guy that has become iconic, leaving, he embraced the, uh, the digital age much quicker than anybody else did and moved his whole life to Austin where he grew up and lives to this day and made a studio in his house. He edits in his house. He writes them. He makes his own studio. He bought an airport and he makes movies out of there now. Out of this, he has three sound stages and, and it's just incredible. So anyway, he gave me this job to play the President of the United States. And I played the President of the United States for him three times now. I am proud of the OSS and their newly formed Spy Kids Division. 
the new one coming out is going to be a, a really thrill, thrilling one too. It's um, we just finished it last summer in Austin, and I think he's putting it all together. It's going to be special effects, amazing. Um, and that is called Heroes. We can be heroes. Um, mm -hmm. Kids movie again, and just with great, great, brilliant, out of the box thinking and and special effects and aliens and all that stuff. I can't can't get too much away, or I'll be in trouble. But um, <laughs> but I've had the I had the great experience of working in that movie. And uh, the first one I did with him actually was um, the Faculty, which was a movie that should have been seen more too. But a lot of up and coming stars were in that movie. That was one of the earlier ones, and uh, you know. Um, uh, you guys ever see The Faculty? I, yeah, I just yeah, watched yeah, it yesterday, yeah. actually, and I wanted to ask you some stuff about it. Good movie, isn't it? Oh, great! I was wondering, like, what was it like to be Elijah Wood's dad in that? How about that? Yeah, I, I we ad lib with stuff like that, where I'd say, "Well, if you can't be your son, then you that magazine when I go downstairs." And, oh my God, it's a new girly magazine, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, things like that that Robert would would uh, would just encourage us to do and. Uh, you know, ad living on, on a Rob Regis film because when you're shooting in film, it's the first time I ever worked in, on, on film like that. And he's with these kids and the camera would be rolling, but mostly cameras when I was doing film starting out, I mean, it's 35 millimeter and it's running. And every time you know, that's, that's, that's just money shooting through a lens. But now you got digital, it keeps it going. Right. So I'm working on, on spy kids and he's teaching all these kids and the camera's going, I, I got to get used to this. It doesn't matter. It's digital. It's digital. It's digital. It's digital. It didn't matter that it was rolling because it just, it's nothing like, it's not, it's free practically. It's data. So instead of, you know, check the, check the chip. It's, I mean, instead of check the gate, it was check the chip. We good? All right, let's move on. <laughs> I think so. But um, yeah, that was a great movie to do. It was a lot of fun to do uh, again in Austin and a terrific cast. Robert Patrick was there. You know, that Elijah Wood is, was a talented kid and still is a really talented kid. He, he makes great choices like that. Those English actors, they get all these breaks now. It's fantastic. <laughs> they do brilliant American accents. And they do, um, and he's done great work in all kinds of different stuff. But uh, it was a lot of fun. Again, a smaller role, but uh, there are small roles. No small roles, only small actors. <laughs> so, um, but that, that was a lot of fun to do. And well, Jordan Brewster turned out to be amazing. Um, a few other big people were in that just uh usher was surprising to see in that how about that usher yeah yeah <laughs> and he and i both did billy flynn on broadway in, in the movie uh, the musical chicago oh, okay it was fun to see that uh you know how, how, how careers just kind of you know, mold with each other and just kind of like in a like an ellipsis kind of go oh yeah i'm crossing those paths like that so it's fun to work with people over the decades that you've worked with earlier on it's just uh it's just kind of a way to connect again it's it's fantastic as um You've mentioned, you know, a lot of directors that have been great to work with. Have you considered directing, hopping and directing yourself now that you've kind of. I, do. I have, and I've been, um, I've been chagrined by the fact that this movie I wanted to do, and I still want to do it. Uh, it's a love story. It's a, uh, it's a, it's not a, a huge cast or anything, but it's, it's a really interesting, interesting idea. And it's called Wildwood Inn. And I, optioned it and we were going to make it and I had the money and then the money fell out. Okay. You lose a year. And mm -hmm. then we ended up again. We got a new casting session. Oh, this is going to be amazing. I need four excellent actors. Had them. Great. Came to it. Boom, boom, boom. Money fell out. The time that happened the third time, I went, okay, I hear you, God. I hear you. It's not happening. Not now. I get it. So it sits on a shelf waiting for some magic to happen. Um, they say never put your own money into your, into your movies because it's, you know, it's got to use other people's money, that kind of thing, because you're going to get beat up anyway. So why, you know, but you can do things. I could probably do it a lot cheaper now, but yes, I have had that dream. I have had that desire. Um, I hope I get to do it before too long, much longer, but uh, because they're just dying out there for product. They're just dying out for content, all these places. So I've had friends who've done it. I've helped friends do their first films. I've helped a lot of people do their first films because I'm fascinated by, A, how'd you get the money? And B, <laughs> how, did, how, did you, how did you pull this off? I mean, how, how was it your first, my first movie is a great book out there called My First Movie. How all these directors did it their first time out. And all the things you learn, all the things you do, you'll, you'll never forget, all the things you'll take with you. And it's a, it's a journey I am really chomping to get. I might have to just do short films for a little bit. 
just just to see if I can wet my my uh, wet my feet in the water there a little bit so that um, I see how much I do like it. But um, like I say, I've been supporting first time directors for forever, and um, much much of the time making really good little movies. Where if they had more money and more you know promotion, they would have made a lot more noise. So, there you go. For sure. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's really a pleasure to meet you. And um, yeah, this is, it's really insightful. And yeah, we look forward to seeing that film whenever, however long it takes, you know, either it's next year or after that, we'll be waiting. Well, thank you, Nelson. And and I think, do all you guys go to school with my daughter, Hannah, over at uh, Chapman? Um, I think me and Nelson know Hannah quite well. Jared went to Chapman as well, um, but I don't think he knows Hannah. Okay. I think, I think cool. I went to the Sporkle event that, that oh, Hannah posted. Yeah. yeah. It was good. Yeah. That was really fun. I've yeah. never met her. I live in a whole different part of the country than these other guys now. So, you live, yeah. dude. Come on, man. Uh, <laughs> you a New Yorker? I live in Kentucky, actually. Dude. Check, please. Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kentucky is nice. Um, yeah, it's well, pretty. It's, it's flawed, but it's a beautiful place, yeah, naturally. Everybody's kind of flawed right now, right? Everything's yeah. Flawed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, that's where George Clooney's from, Kentucky. Yeah, uh -huh. and Johnny Depp, too, I'm believing. Depp. Yeah, he's from actually my hometown. <laughs> Is that right? Mm-hmm. Going through a little bit of a hell right now, isn't he? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's, that's right. too famous for me. I'll take uh, my life, my trajectory much better than that, although he's a very, very talented guy. But, boy, I mean... They get you get beat up by the media these days, and they just take you to task, and they take you to town. <laughs> not that, no. I mean, but, not even just the media. You get taken to town by with social media now. Just people in general. Mm -hmm. you know? Everyone's got an opinion. Twitter, baby. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's just too much. It really is. And I, I try to stay away from that thing. But all my my team says you got to get more active. You got to be out there on the on the in the, on the internet. <laughs> It's just not me. Sorry. <laughs> what I had for breakfast, man. We're so like, who the hell cares what you had for breakfast? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's how it all started out. You got to tweet. <laughs> yeah, I'm prepared. Yeah. It's been a pleasure, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, it's nice to go down memory lane in those old classic little children's films and uh, right down your guys' alley, too, when you were growing up. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's it called? Slime House? Slime House. Slime. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Nice. Max, do you want to give the backstory of how the name came to came? Oh, to sure. I can give a quick backstory. Yes. Pretty much, it was just in high school. Me and a bunch of friends were talking about like all these certain movies that we grew up with that like are similar. Like they're family movies, family comedies for the most part. But there's something about the way they look and the way they're written that kind of stands out a little bit. So as a joke, we kind of took like the word grind house, like for like exploitation movies and turned it to slime house. Cause we yeah. felt they're kind of like exploitation movies aimed towards children. <laughs> 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 Cause they're just kind of, yeah. So <laughs> I guess that's kind of the way we came up with it. And yeah, I just made a list of all the movies and several of yours, as we said, made the list of flubber spy kids too. And, House arrest I actually hadn't seen, but now it's on the list. And okay, good. good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, great. That's that's a funny idea. That uh, well, I wish you well with this gentleman. I hope you got a lot of my co-stars and get them to. Because a lot of people did the same. These are the movies that were out there at that time. Oh, so, yeah. 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 Because yeah. we embraced exactly. them and ran with them. What the hell? You know. Yeah. Sure. So, All right, thanks so much. Mm, thank you yeah, so thank much. You so much. How, do I, how do I turn this thing off? You, uh, I think you just X out of it. Yeah. So. X out of it. All right. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot for having me. Take it us. easy, Christopher. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much, you man. Guys. Take care. Bobby.